claimed that he had read my writing and that I said that there was no cheating in the Iranian election. Um, and so I just have to say he didn't read it very carefully or else he's deliberately misrepresenting what I wrote. Because I never said there was no cheating. What I said was that the Iranian opposition never put together a coherent story that the election was stolen in the common sense meaning of the term. What I take to be the common sense meaning of the term stolen is you have an election and one guy got the votes and you play with the things to produce a result that the other guy um, had the votes. And there's a, a deliberate blending of things that uh, Kava and other people do to conflate what, two issues that I think are really separate. One is, you know, no reasonable person would claim that the Iranian system as it exists today or existed a year ago or existed five years ago, it meets some uh, you know, platonic ideal of democracy. Obviously, there are there is the restrictions of you know selections of uh, you know candidates. This is totally beyond dispute. But the claim that was made in the immediate aftermath of the election by people associated with the opposition was much sharper than that. They claim, in fact, Mosavi declared victory, he said that he got the majority of votes. That's a fantastic fantasy fairy tale. If you believe that the Bush administration blew up the World Trade Center, then you should believe the story that Mousavi told about the Iranian election because you don't, you know, you don't belong to the world of evidence. The, the, the Iranian opposition never put forward evidence to substantiate this claim. They had thousands of observers. The, the Iranian government published the vote tallies uh, on the web, the uh, Musabi people could have said, you know, in this place, the government tally didn't match our, what our observers said. In this place, our observers are blocked. They never uh, did that. So that's not to say that there were no shenanigans around the election, nor to contest. As I said, nobody contests that, you know, it's not democracy when some group of people gets to uh, exclude candidates. Um, but the, the, the stolen election claim is <clears throat> never substantiated by the um, Iranian opposition, um, and that's what I uh, that's what I wrote. We can check it. It's on uh, it's on Huffington Post. One reason that this uh, matters is that the if you believe the stolen election claim, then and you believe which the you know the the, the Masabi people want you to believe and that he got a majority of votes. Then you believe that the majority of the Iranian population is following Mr. Masabi and the opposition. And that's, a, again, an unsubstantiated uh, claim. Um, and uh, for you know, uh, the you know, pre-election Western polling indicated that Ahmadinejad would probably win. There was a Pew Research poll just a few weeks ago. Um, uh, the, uh, so this is why, I'm uh, sorry, just a second. Uh, the worldpublicopinion.org project of the program International Policy Attitudes University of Maryland published a poll in late August and early September. They found 81% of Iranians say they consider Ahmadinejad to be Iran's legitimate president. 62% said they have a lot of confidence in the declared uh, election result. 21% said they had some confidence. 13% said that they don't, they have, uh, they do not have much confidence or no confidence at all. Now, the only reason I bring this up, and I didn't bring this up in my talk, I know that among many Iranian Americans, and Iran in the United States, there's a big split on this issue. And I know I'm not going to convince anybody that's already on there. So I just like I never argue with the 9-11 people because they're religiously committed to this. But um, the, uh, the, but the, well, you know, I mean, it's like, do you live in the world of evidence or not? Let the Masabi people say where their uh, tallies didn't match the government. Or be clear, I mean, as some people have said after the election, look, it's not about the election itself. It's about the Guardian Council and so on and so forth. And as I said, I don't dispute that at all. And I only bring this up because Kava said that I said that there's no cheating, which I never um, wrote. But besides that, besides that, but put all that to the side. Diplomacy is a relationship between governments. You can't have diplomacy, you know, if you're trying to have negotiation with another country, you have to deal with the government that's there. The United States doesn't get to pick the government of Iran or any other country. It doesn't get to pick the process by which, um, by which the other countries select their leaders. And in fact, it's odd to me that Kabe is using the example of 1953. He's got this story of, you know, the United States has the history of backing the wrong side. 
that as somebody from the anti-imperialist tradition in the United States, I wouldn't have put it that way. The, the, the United States did wrong in 1953 was not backing the wrong side. It was overthrowing a democratically elected government. The principle is that the United States doesn't get to choose other countries' uh, leaders or their processes. It shouldn't be intervening on any side to say these are the right people uh, to run Iran and these are uh, the wrong people uh, to run Iran. So that, to me, is the uh, principle there. And I think that the, uh, finally, and here I'll conclude, the, um, the overwhelming story here is that we're, you know, we're in the United States, we're talking about the policy of the United States government. You have to take responsibility, I think, if you want to intervene politically in the United States. It's another thing if you're, you know, you're Iranian, you're talking about the Iranian political process, that has nothing to do with me. The, uh, I'm an American in the United States talking about the U.S. government policy. And the context in which we are in is a context in which you know, 410 members of the, of the House would vote uh, for sanctions and six people would oppose, and the majority of Americans would tell a pollster that, yes, we'll support military force if it's necessary to, to stop Iran from having a nuclear weapon. I think the example of Tchaikovsky is in, instructive. Whatever you think about Jan Tchaikovsky, if you were like making a map of members of the United States Congress and you, def d you know, divide them into groups according to like how you know, responsive they are to the concerns of people in the peace movement in the United States, she would be in like, you know, the top 10%. So maybe that's depressing. Well, that's the world that we have to deal with. So um, I, I just think it's, it's very dangerous to kind of like wish away the fact that we're in the United States and we have to take political responsibility for what's happening in the United States. It's not me that decided that Iran's nuclear program was uh, an issue that the United States um, was determined to deal with. And that's why we're in the juncture that we're in. The, op the, the choices that we face are you know, diplomacy, crippling sanctions, or war. So if you don't want crippling sanctions or war, then I'm afraid that in the US political context, you have to support diplomacy. Um. Well, you're right. I mean, I did not read uh, the piece you wrote on elections um, as carefully as I should have. Um, I actually stopped when you offered $10,000 for uh, anyone who can prove, give evidence that uh, she didn't happen. And I actually wrote a comment. I said, well, keep your $10,000. I'll give you $1 or I, not as a price. I'll just give it to you. If you can prove that cheating hadn't happened, uh, that you know the observers had not been disallowed from. I mean, part of the problem is that uh, you know the trend in elections in Iran is that the observers have to go and sign, sign up the the results of the the vote count, and uh, you know they've never actually shown whether observers of Musavi and Karubi and the other opposition candidates have actually signed these uh, ledgers that say that all right, we've seen, we've been part of the count, and we've approved it. Why? Because all of, a lot of them are in jail. A lot of them are afraid for their situation. We live in a situation of coup d'etat. Uh, look, the, the, the issue is, I mean, the, I, I raised because I raised the issue of the elections because it's completely missing from, from this account. We all agree that, yes, they should talk. Diplo you know, diplomatic is better than war and better than sanctions. Yeah. What will sanctions do to Iran? Sa economic sanctions will not hurt the regime. They will not hurt the military. The milita Iranian military, the Revolutionary Guards, had been in charge of smuggling gasoline out to Iraq, to you know, to through Kurdistan, through Basra, through to Turkey, to Pakistan. You know, Iran gasoline in Iran is about you know 10, 15 cents a gallon, a liter, or 10, 10, you know, about 50 cents a gallon, right? It makes a lot more sense to smuggle it and then sell it overseas and you know pocket the money. And then import some more at, you know, uh, through the pockets of the government. The borders are controlled by the Revolutionary Guards, and this is fairly well known, right? All the smuggling networks are controlled by this by this military network. Uh, so sanctions will not hurt the military; they will hurt ordinary people. They will just hollow out civil society. People who become impoverished even more than they are now will have to struggle, you know, thinking about, you know, how to pay their rent and how to put their kids through school and how to buy bread and, you know, food uh, and put it on the table and they will not think about, you know, politics or resistance. This is exactly what happened in Iraq in the, in the 1980s, which consolidated, in the 1990s, which consolidated Saddam Hussein's position. 
to become an even more, uh, you know, a worse tyrant. This is what will happen in Iran with sanctions. We agree that this is not a good, good option. But as I said, I think the Iranian military is quite willing to negotiate away its, uh, you know, its nuclear program in a face-saving uh, parameter. The problem is, if we do not bring in the other really key issue, that of human rights. Now, I do agree with the following. I don't think the U.S. has any interest in human rights systematically in terms of its foreign policy. Um, I, I, I don't think it has, you know, it will be completely hypocritical, for example, for the U.S. to turn to the Iranian government and say that, well, why did you carry out a coup d'etat if you did? The United States supported the coup d'etat in Algeria. The United States has supported the worst authoritarian regimes in the, in the region, and it kind of boosts them up. It supported the coup d'etat in Iran, right? So it, it's in no position to condemn coup d'etats or torture or the breaking of, you know, of, of the rules of the political game. And it, frankly, it has no business coming and interfering in domestic Iranian uh, politics. That's the business of Iranians, and they're taking care of it. But what the U.S. can say diplomatically in its negotiations with Iran, if it has the foresight to think that it wants in the long run to have the Iranian people, you know, look favorably, favorably and not with animosity toward the United States, is the following. Behind closed doors in these negotiations, the U.S. can say that, look, we can't sell a deal to our own public, to the people who've killed Nadav Abbas Sultan on the world, on world cameras. What is wrong with saying that? What is, if, if you're demanding negotiations, what is wrong with saying that you have to enter you know, this parameter into your negotiations? We have to demand the U.S. not to sell off the Iranian population. It can't do this. It can't say that, look, we can't sell a deal with uh, you know, Ahmadinejad and Khamenei and the Revolutionary Guards to our own public while you're doing this. So get your hand off the neck of the people, let the newspapers open up, free the political prisoners, stop the show trials, stop interfering with people's lives, you know, lay off, get a better image of yourself, and you know, we're, we, can do, we can do business with you, which is in both our interests. This is what diplomats do, unfortunately. This is what states do. There's no morality in it. But self-interest has to be part of this. And my problem with the narrative that Robert presents, I mean, the elections basically fit into it. All his narrative is to say that, look, you know, the Iranian state is really not that bad. You know, I mean, they really, the elections didn't happen like this because three weeks before the elections, somebody called from the U.S., called people's homes in Iran, and asked them, who are you going to vote for? Are you going to vote for Ahmadinejad? Do you like Ahmadinejad? I mean, you know, what kind of logic is this? If, you have, if you're completely unfamiliar with that society, what, how do you think people will react? We, we were at, uh, you know, two weeks ago, we were at, uh, uh, in Ann Arbor on another kind of similar panel, and one of our colleagues in, in Ann Arbor uh, was talking about the fact that he had been in Iran during the elections, that he went to this car factory. He interviewed an, a U.S.-based academic going to an Iranian car factory, which is government-owned, in a labor market that they've changed the labor laws to basically be allowed them to lay off anybody because of the managers say that you're not, you're not doing your work. He goes to this factory, calls the workers in with the supervisor president and says, well, who are you going to vote for? <laughs> All of them say Ahmadinejad. The vast majority say Ahmadinejad. And for this colleague, this was very kind of convincing argument. After the election, he goes back to the same factory and asked the supervisor, can I talk to the you know, workers and find out who they voted for? He said, well, you know, I'd rather you didn't because the people who actually support Ahmadinejad really feel insecure and ashamed. <laughs> if the majority voted for Ahmadinejad, they, you know, they all know who they are. You know, they, they, they would all, you know, they're all in the shame together, right? <laughs> unless, unless the majority were saying in public what would save their jobs and not jeopardize them, and then in the voting poll would vote as they pleased, you know, for whoever they pleased. I mean, you know, the, the naivete, the misunderstanding of the dynamic in Iran, and kind of leaving, leaving it out of strategic thinking about diplomacy is, is deadly in this case. So we need to bring in the issue of human rights. We can't negate it. It's the task of the peace movement to see how we can put it creatively and force our government to actually consider this issue and not make a deal with, you know, with, with, uh, with the militaries who are in power.